Thank you, Marianne, and uh, thank you and the committee for inviting me this morning. Um, so, um, can you hear me well? Um, I'm going to talk about um, what neuroimaging can tell us about the neurobiological correlates of personality disorder. And the neurobiological correlates of personality disorder are important, of course, because they may show us vulnerabilities and sensitivities for people to develop personality disorders. The neurobiology may be uh, a result of genetic inheritance, of epigenetic factors, of early life experience, of trauma exposures. So there's an integration between the biological and the developmental and psychological factors, uh, really in both directions. So um, let me um, give you kind of a, a map of uh, what I'll be, uh, of the plan of my talk. I'm going to talk about um, different elements of, that we know about, um, let, me, let me come over here and try this, um, about the neurobiology of personality. I'm going to talk specifically about borderline personality disorder because the vast bulk of the work on the neurobiology has been done with borderline personality disorder. And um, so this is a kind of map of what we'll be talking about. Um, the, um, the center box, uh, what I'm calling task-independent features, these are the core features of the uh, personality disorder. Um, the uh, baseline, the, the brain structures of people with borderline personality disorder, and also the uh, kind of baseline um, network connections in the brains of people with uh, borderline personality disorder at rest, uh, just how the various parts of the brain uh, relate to each other when the person is at rest tells us something about the functional connectivity. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the neural correlates of the key uh, phenotypic elements of borderline personality disorder, affective instability, which we've already heard about, um, and there's a lot of data we'll talk about there, impulsive aggression in borderline patients, the relationship disturbances. What do we know about neurobiological underpinnings of some of the relationship disturbances? And also something about the strange way that pain is processed in borderline patients, which uh, will connect up to the uh, non-suicidal self-injurious behavior we know is present in borderline patients. So um, to start, I'm going to start with um, talking about these task-independent features. And first, um, what do we know about the structure of the brains of people with borderline personality? There have been a number of uh, reviews, studies of the brain, uh, mapping out specific regions, and other studies using voxel-based morphometry. And there are a number of findings that have emerged. One is that the hippocampus in borderline patients has a decreased gray matter volume. And um, a number of studies have suggested that that may be correlated with early abuse or trauma experiences. Um, the amygdala, which of course is a uh, part of the brain that we're all very interested in, um, in terms of its volume in borderline patients, there are very mixed findings. Some studies have shown it's larger, some have shown it's smaller, some have shown no difference. And then these uh, frontal control regions in the brain, the middle prefrontal cortex and the anterior cingulate, um, a number of studies, including one done by our group, has shown decreased volumes, gray matter volumes. This is the uh, middle prefrontal cortex, and you see that in healthy people, this is the volume, and in borderline patients, this is the volume, significantly less. We also looked at avoidant personality as a psychopathological comparison group, and that's kind of in the middle. And also here, the pregenual anterior cingulate, again, lower in borderlines than in healthies. Now, um, the um, network connectivity, that's a kind of very interesting area. We can look at how, we know of course that different parts of the brain work in concert and that most of the activities that are carried out in the brain are carried out by complex networks. How do we find out what those networks are and when they're activated? Well, one way that we do that is we look at correlations between the neural activity in different parts of the brain. So we find different regions of the brain show activity that's 
synchronized with each other, we make the assumption that those regions are in some way connected, that they could be so well synchronized. And that's called functional connectivity. And there are a number of networks in the brain that have been identified in healthy people uh, that are important uh, connected networks. And these networks are uh, the default mode network, which is a pretty famous network. This is an area of the brain that includes uh, the middle frontal cortex, the uh, 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 parietal cortex, the uh, uh, posterior cingulate, the precuneus and cuneus areas. And this is an area that comes online when people are not doing anything, when they're just kind of resting, introspecting. It's a part of the brain that seems to be active when people are thinking about themselves, self-referential thinking, introspective activity. And when people start to do some task, this area goes down in activity. And then there's um, the salience network. That includes the um, uh, insula on both sides, the uh, anterior cingulate cortex, and the amygdala. And this is a part of the brain that takes in uh, external experience and says, gee, how important is this emotionally to me? Uh, how am I going to prioritize this? And how am I going to decide how I want to respond to the situation? Um, and so an area obviously important for us in the study of personality. And then the central executive network, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the posterior uh, cingulate cortex, um, uh, the parietal cortex is involved in uh, working memory, attention allocation, when one is going to do tasks. Well, there's an interesting study done by um, Dahl and uh, uh, his group, which looked at the connectivity between these um, intrinsic networks in healthy people and in borderline patients. And this um, graph that they uh, produced shows the connectivity between different regions, and the thickness of the line is an indication of the strength of the connectivity. So this area here is the default mode network, this area here is the uh, salience network, and this is the central executive network. And this is the connectivity, again, at rest, uh, in healthy people lying in a scanner, and this is borderline patients. And you can see from this plot that there is much less connectivity both within these networks, the default network, uh, the salience network, and the uh, central executive network in borderline patients than in healthies, and also less connectivity between networks. So uh, kind of an interesting baseline of how the brain is connected just at baseline in borderline patients. Well, now I want to go on to what do we know about what the brain is doing as borderline patients are performing various tasks? And one is processing emotion. And we know that affective instability is a really important feature of borderline disorder. And um, we can look at that from a number of uh, perspectives. One is the excitability of the amygdala, uh, the limbic system in borderline patients. Is, is their limbic system extra excitable? Does it just get easily aroused? And the other is the parts of the brain that regulate that, the um, prefrontal cortex that controls the amygdala and controls the activity. And so um, we would hypothesize that affective instability in borderline patients comes from some interaction between a highly excitable limbic system and a not so efficient uh, down-regulating system in the prefrontal cortex. So, um, uh, so let me show you what we know. One of the oldest findings in the uh, psychobiology of borderline patients is the hyperactivity of the amygdala. And a group by Donegan at Yale back in 2003 showed that when uh, borderline patients are looking at emotional faces, that their amygdalas are more active, that's the black bar, than healthy controls, looking at the same emotional faces. Um, Minzenberg uh, showed the same finding here. This is the uh, right amygdala, the left amygdala. This little bar up here reflects the um, borderline patients 
looking at fearful faces, uh, and the lower bar are healthies looking at fearful faces. And we looked at, um, we looked not at faces, but we looked at emotional scenes, scenes in which people are interacting in an aversive kind of setting, and we found also that the borderline patients showed more activity here, in this case in the left amygdala, than the healthies. Now, um, we've talked a lot about the amygdala and the, the world and the emotional world for a long time has been very amygdala-centric, but there's a really important region of the brain, um, the insula, that people are beginning to uh, talk more about. This is where the insula is located, inside the brain, and the insula is part of that salience network. It's really a central node of the salience network, and it participates in appraising the emotional salience of a situation by integrating the affective experience, the cognitive experience, and our physical, you know, physiological, somatic experience of emotion. Um, and it generates an awareness of our emotional state by um, linking the mind and the body experience. And um, in a study by uh, Rugoko's group, and I think he may be here at this meeting, um, in a uh, meta-analysis which looked at a series of imaging studies of uh, borderline patients compared to healthies, they found that there was a greater insula, right insula activity um, looking at negative images in the borderlines compared to the healthy controls. So um, suggestion of a kind of hyper-aroused uh, limbic system. Now, the next thing we hypothesized is that the downward control mechanisms may not be working as well. Um, and these are some of the regions that are prefrontal areas that downregulate the emotion, uh, the amygdala. And um, we decided to look at um, two emotional controlling tasks. Um, we have um, systems of regulating our emotion, and one very commonly employed strategy that we use is cognitive reappraisal. And that's making ourselves feel less disturbed by a situation by creating a different narrative, a different cognitive story that makes it more uh, uh, less disturbing. So you go into the hospital, you visit a friend, he's in, in bed with all these tubes, it's really a really horrible scene, and you think, well, this is true, but he's in a really great hospital. Uh, he's got pneumonia. I know, I know antibiotics treat pneumonia. He's going to get better. So you create a cognitive reframe that makes it less disturbing. And that's situational reinterpretation. And the other kind of, re, of uh, cognitive reappraisal is distancing. This is what the uh, emergency room doctor does. Patients wheeled in, but in a horrible accident. It's a gruesome sight. But in order to function effectively as a physician, the doctor has to take a clinical distance. And we do this all the time, and it helps us to process. So what we wanted to look at um, is whether or not borderline patients were less effective in using these pretty adaptive uh, regulation strategies. And we wanted to look specifically at uh, of the two different varieties of cognitive reappraisal, the distancing variety, because it seemed, and those of you who work with borderline patients may have the same experience, that borderline patients kind of get very uh, involved. It's hard for them to pull back from situations. So we thought that that might be particularly interesting to look at. And so um, this is how we looked at it in the scanner. We showed um, our patients emotional pictures, uh, negative and neutral pictures. These are from the International Affective Pictures Center standardized set of pictures. And um, before we brought them into the scanner, we trained them in distancing. We said, you know, look at these pictures. Look at the picture as though you're an anthropologist, you know, just observing the scene. Or as though this is someone who has nothing to do with you. They're nothing like you. Uh, and people get, catch on it's pretty easily to do this. We have them practice outside the scanner. Then we bring them into the scanner, and we uh, show them pictures. And for half of the pictures, we ask them to use the distancing strategy that we taught them. And for the other half, we say, just look at the picture and let yourself feel whatever emotion comes up. And uh, then we ask them to rate how positively or negative they're feeling after they see the picture. So we can compare 
the regions of the brain that are active when people are distancing compared to when they're just looking. And when we look at that for um, borderline patients versus healthy controls, it turns out that one key area of the brain that is more highly activated in healthy people than in borderline people is this dorsal anterior cingulate. And if you uh, unpack each group in this, you see the blue line represents the healthies, and you see that when the healthies go from looking to applying the distancing strategy, they're turning on this area. They're increasing the activation. The borderlines are not. If anything, they're decreasing it. One would expect that if this area is being activated, since this area downregulates the amygdala, we would expect then to see the amygdala downregulated during distancing, and that's what we found here, that in the healthies, the amygdala is downregulated when they're distancing. So now um, we asked, are there treatment implications about this? Could it be possible for people to practice this and somehow to get their brains a little exercised and be able to use this technique better? So we um, designed this study, um, and um, I'm going to show you the data for half the study so far. So it's uh, 14 uh, borderlines uh, and 16 uh, controls in the distancing condition, and then we have a control condition. So the study here, I'm showing you four arms of the study, borderline patients and healthy controls. And for each group, we had two arms. In one arm, the subjects were trained in distancing, and in the other arm, they weren't. So in the distancing arm, they come in T1 the first day. They get the same distancing training that I described before. They go in the scanner and get scanned, just like I showed you before. Then they come in um, a second day, a third day, and a fourth day, and they get more practice with our research assistants kind of walking them through the process. They practice on 90 pictures over these uh, four days um, outside of the scanner. And then they come back on day five, and they do it again in the scanner. So we can see if there's any change in the brain activity. Um, and uh, let me show you uh, what we found. This is the behavioral result. So here's how um, they're rating the valence of the pictures uh, after the picture goes off. This is the group that's had the uh, training, the distancing training, looking at negative pictures. And you see on day one, the blue line are the borderlines and the red line are the healthies. So on day one, the borderlines throughout are uh, rating the pictures more negatively than the healthies. You see on day one, the borderlines are higher. But over the training period, the borderlines actually reduce how negatively they're rating the pictures. And uh, it's uh, statistically different uh, by the end. So that's what's going on behaviorally. What's going on in the brain? Well, we found if we compared the activity in the brain from day five to day one in the borderline group versus the healthy control group, we found um, a number of areas that showed differences. And one area here is the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. That's one of the areas that is involved in downregulation in cognitive reappraisal. And so this is what's going on in the healthy people on day one. Um, the, the green bar is the activity in the dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex when looking at neutral pictures. The red bar is when they're looking at the negative pictures. And the blue bar is when they're looking at the negative pictures and told distance from the pictures. And you see that the healthy people are bringing online this region this control region when they're distancing. What are the borderline patients doing on day one? Well, you see the borderline patients are not bringing on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex on day one. So what happens after they've had five days of practice? So this is the borderlines on day five. And you see that they are able to bring on the DLPFC when they're distancing. They look much like the healthies did on day one. So we found this very exciting and very encouraging. Um, looked at the healthy controls on day five, and they're actually not increasing the activity here. We think this may be because they're getting so good at it that they're more efficient and they don't need you know, so much blood flow in the brain to do it. 
But we were very uh, excited by this finding. We also found the same thing on the right DLPFC. And then um, to look at behavioral correlates, we looked at the decrease in amygdala activation as a result of this uh, practice. And we found that there was a, a direct correlation between how much they were able to downregulate their amygdala and the drop in their negative affect. So it linked up to a, a behavioral finding. Well, the next thing uh, we wanted to look at is another um, control mechanism that we all use. This is a kind of more automatic control. It's habituation. Um, you know, when we see something disturbing, repeatedly we kind of get used to it and it doesn't bother us as much. And we were wondering whether or not borderline patients didn't have as much of this capacity to habituate. So um, habituation is an adaptive emotion regulation mechanism where healthy people reduce their negative reactions upon repeated exposure to these aversive stimuli. And it's a component that's incorporated in many psychotherapies. It's certainly uh, kind of the uh, uh, paradigmatic uh, element of systematic desensitization, but it's present in, in many psychotherapies, of course. And in healthy people, it's been shown that when people habituate, they do reduce their amygdala activity, their insula activity, uh, all these uh, regions that we're interested in, the anterior cingulate, and so forth. So this is the way we looked at that. We showed our patients uh, pictures in the scanner, again, these uh, IAPS pictures, in sequence, and they rated their uh, feelings, their valence of the picture. But some of the pictures were repeated throughout the period of the scan. Um, so you see this picture is repeated, this picture is repeated. And so we were able to look at activation when people are looking at pictures that they've seen for the first time versus pictures they've seen a second time. Um, this is the behavioral result, which is those that in the healthies but not the borderlines, there was a decrease in how negatively the pictures are experienced when they're seen a second time. And this is what's going on in the brain. We found that we compared the activity when looking at repeat pictures versus novel pictures in the borderlines versus the healthies, that the healthy people activated this region here, again, the uh, anterior cingulate, dorsal anterior cingulate, more than the borderlines did. So you see if you unpack this, the healthies looking at novel pictures and looking at repeat pictures show much more activation in this DLT. The borderlines don't. We also included avoidance as a psychopathological control group, and the avoidance also don't bring this area on very much, but the healthies do. We wanted to see whether or not um, this um, fit with our hypothesis that an impairment in the ability to habituate was associated with affective instability. So we looked at correlations between the um, extent to which this DACC area was brought online and affective instability. And you see that for the borderline patients and the healthy controls, the more they're able to bring this line on, the less affective instability they have measured by a scale, the affective uh, lability scale. Um, now, the uh, healthies are able to bring this area on more, so they tend to have lower affective instability, as you would expect. The borderlines don't bring this area on so much, and they have more affective instability. We also looked at uh, connectivity. We talked before about networks in the resting state. We also looked at connectivity um, during this habituation process and found that when healthy subjects uh, are looking at repeat pictures compared to uh, novel pictures, they show greater connectivity between the insula and both the left and right amygdalas. So we used the insula um, because it's such a key region in emotion processing as the seed region to see what areas showed connectivity during uh, habituation. And you see that uh, for healthies, there was an increase in connectivity here, but not for the borderlines or for the avoidance. 
Well, then we decided uh, this is a good thing. I should also mention that a, another member of our group, Aaron Hazlett, has published work also showing that borderline patients don't habituate uh, the way healthies do. Um, so then we decided this is a good thing. Let's see how far we can push it. And so we decided instead of just showing the picture once as a repeat, let's show it five times and watch what happens for each of the five successive uh, views. And let's bring the people back three days later and show them the same pictures and see what's happened to their brains you know, during that interim over three days. Um, so this shows the um, activity in the amygdala uh, on the first viewing, the second viewing, third viewing, fourth viewing, and fifth viewing of the picture on day one. And then this is day two when they came back uh, three days later. The, um, so you see the uh, dark uh, bar are the borderline patients and the uh, yellow, the, this uh, red bar here are the healthies and this yellow bar are the um, avoidants. And you see that on day one, actually all of them tend to uh, downregulate in the amygdala. They tend to habituate in the amygdala. But when they come back two day, three days later, we were actually surprised by what we found. The borderline patients suddenly show this jump up in amygdala activity when they looked at the same pictures they'd seen three days before and had downregulated. And that's not true with the other two groups. And this is uh, statistically significant. Um, we found it also true in the insula. Um, this was uh, a kind of really intriguing finding that there's a kind of bounce back or exposure to negative pictures on day one leads to a more negative reaction on day two. Um, and we also uh, wanted to connect this up with affective instability, and we found that the degree to which there was a jump up in amygdala activity from day one to day two was correlated with how much affective instability the patients had. Well, now uh, let me shift, gear and talk, shift gears and talk a little bit about impulsive aggression. Um, I won't be able to, there won't be time to say as much about each of these other areas, um, so I chose my favorite one to spend the most time on. But with impulsive aggression, let me tell you an experiment that Antonia New in our group did, um, looking at a laboratory test of aggression called the point subtraction aggression paradigm. What this is, is you have subjects come into the laboratory and they play a computer game, they play a game, a computer game, with what they believe is another person. You know, you have to always be suspicious when you come into a psychology lab and they tell you you're playing with another person. In fact, it's a computer they're playing with. Um, the object of the game is to get as many points as possible, which you can trade in for, for dollars, a little bit of money. And the way you get the points is you're given a box with three buttons. The more times you push the A button, you just keep pushing the A button and you start getting points. Um, the B button doesn't get you any points, but it takes points away from the other guy you think you're playing with. And the C button just gives you like a timeout. So you tell there's this other guy with the same button box and you're playing. Well, of course, there's no other player, but what we can do is we can control when points are taken away. So you're playing and pushing, trying to accumulate points. And then at a certain point, you see this other guy's taking points away from you. That's quite a provocation. It makes people very angry. And in fact, when we did this with borderline patients, we actually got some who damaged the button box. <laughs> um, so, um, so we did this, and we could look at the brain activity uh, when borderline patients were provoked versus unprovoked. Um, by how much time there was between uh, points being taken away. And this shows the, uh, this is a PET study, so it's looking at um, glucose metabolic rate. And you see that there's a difference between the borderlines and the healthies in the orbital frontal cortex, an area that's involved in uh, impulse control, that the borderline patients show much greater uh, metabolic activity in the provoked state than in the unprovoked state, but not in the healthy controls. And if you look at what's going on metabolically in the amygdala, the blue bar are the healthies. This is unprovoked and this is provoked. You see that the healthies don't show much increase in amygdala activity with the provocation, but the borderlines uh, sure do. Um, 
Um, this is a study um, done by uh, Dan Roselle in our group. Um, I'm going to move on. It's a study looking at the uh, density of the uh, of a serotonin receptor in patients with uh, impulsive aggression and personality disorder, showing that there are more uh, higher density of the 2A type, subtype of uh, the serotonin receptor in the people who are uh, currently uh, actively impulsively aggressive. Now let me talk about the relationship disturbances. This is uh, it's also one of my favorite areas. Um, and there's been a, a number of interesting studies. One study um, was done first in healthy subjects by Naomi Eisenberg and Matt Lieberman a number of years ago. And they wanted to look at rejection sensitivity. Now we, we all know that borderlines are particularly rejection sensitive. So this is interesting. And they had another one of these computer games where they brought people into the lab. This game is called Cyberball. And um, again, the subject thinks they're playing against two other people. And uh, the people are represented by these avatars. Um, and they toss a ball back and forth. And then this little hand represents the subject. So they toss the ball back and forth. And then they throw it to the subject. And he tosses it back. And there's this nice three-way hand toss going on. At a certain point, however, the uh, malevolent uh, researchers change the, the pattern, and they have these two uh, avatars stop throwing the ball to the subject. And surprisingly, people really get upset by this. They feel rejected. And um, if you look at what's going on in the brains, you do this when people are in the scanner, you find that um, this region, the anterior cingulate, again, gets activated when people are experiencing this rejection. Now, this is a very interesting, and you see that the, the intensity of activation in this area is actually directly correlated with how disturbed the people reported they felt at being rejected. Now, this is a very interesting area of the brain because, um, as you know, this is one of the brain areas that's involved in the emotional aspect of pain processing. So when people are rejected, they're getting activity in the pain regions. You know, we, we all say that it really hurts to be rejected. Well, Naomi Eisenman and Matt Liebman showed that it really does hurt. Uh, so what goes on in borderline patients? Well, this is a study that recently came out by Dumsala's group. And what they did was they, um, again, played the cyber, had subjects play the cyberball game. It's a little bit more elegant. They had three conditions. In one condition, there's the inclusion condition, where the subject, uh, the ball is tossed to the subject. There's the exclusion condition, where they stop tossing the ball. And then there's a third really nice control condition, where the subjects are told the ball is going to be tossed around based on an algorithm. The other people aren't going to really make a decision about whether to throw it to you or not. It's just automatically done by an algorithm. And this is the activity in um, a number of regions of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the precuneus, uh, and the middle prefrontal cortex. Now, the dashed line are the healthy controls. You see that when the healthy controls are included, here there's a good deal of activation in the DLPFC. When they're excluded, the activation drops. Um, in the control condition, the activation is much lower. But in the borderline patients, there's very little responsivity. There's very little change, regardless of whether they're being rejected or not rejected. And this is quite consistent with all the regions of the brain. So in, in a way, this is a little bit counterintuitive, because we know borderline patients are very rejection sensitive. We think their brains are really reacting a lot. But, um, but this, this section of the brain is actually kind of insensitive to this social phenomenon. I want to keep, keep that in mind because I'm going to show you another experiment looking at a different social phenomena. And this is an experiment um, using the trust game that was done by Bricks King Cassis. And um, again, people are brought into the laboratory, and they're told that they're going to play a 10-round game in which they invest money in an investor. So they are given a certain amount of money, um, and they give it to a trustee, and the money triples when the trustee gets it. You know, really, the stock market is really doing great. The money triples, and now the trustee decides 
to give back a certain percentage of what the investor gave him and to keep a certain amount, you know, his, his own uh, uh, interest, his own profit. Uh, and it's up to the trustee how much to give back. And then the investor makes the decision on the next round, and clearly their decision is going to be made, you know, based in part on how much the trustee gave them back and what the history of that relationship was like. Well, they studied this with uh, trustees who were borderline patients and trustees who were just uh, ordinary healthy controls. And it turns out that with the borderline patients, if you look at how much money is getting invested with uh, with a, a trustee, if the trustee is a healthy trustee, that during the course of the game, you know, close to 50% of the amount of money that the investor had each time is given to the in trustee um, at the beginning and at the end. But with the borderline patients at the beginning, borderline trustees, at the beginning, the other person is tending to invest more, but toward the end of the game, the person is not really investing much money in this borderline trustee. Saying that the borderline trustee somehow is interacting in terms of how much they're giving back to the subject in a way that doesn't enhance the development of this alliance. Um, well, they looked at um, what was going on in the brain when this happens, and they found that there was an interesting difference in the, um, between the borderline patients and the healthies in the um, anterior insula. So this shows the activation of the anterior insula in healthy subjects based on the amount of money that's being invested with the trustee each round. So when the trustee is getting a, a good deal of money, the anterior insula is relatively quiet. But when they're not getting much money this round, the uh, anterior insula gets pretty excited. But with borderline patients, this line is flat. So once again, the borderline patients' brains are not responding to a, kind of a social norm violation. Um, so one could speculate, here we have two different social phenomena where the borderline brains are actually much, much less sensitive and responsive. And one could hypothesize that because of that, because they don't have these kind of automatic ways of dealing with social situations that might be distressing, they may have to use, you know, kind of bring on board a number of additional strategies, make things uh, much more tumultuous. Uh, let me just say a little bit about uh, pain processing. Um, so we know self-injurious behavior is present in borderline patients. Borderline patients have been shown to have a higher pain threshold than healthy people, and there are differences in the pain processing pathways in borderline patients. And there have been a couple of studies by Christian Schmal's group in Germany that have looked at the effect of pain on um, uh, amygdala activity in borderline patients. In um, the studies, they had the patients in a stressful situation, and then they exposed them to some pain. In one series of study, the pain was thermal pain. Um, there's a, a sort of an electrical device on their forearm that would heat up, and they would experience pain. And in the other study, um, they actually um, cut the, the borderline patient's forearm with a scalpel. Um, and so they had a control condition where they kind of uh, just rubbed the scalpel again, the back of the scalpel, and then a pain condition where they made, you know, a little one centimeter, uh, not very deep cut. And they found that um, they exposed all of their subjects to stress. Um, they used the Trier social stress test, which is you bring people into a room and you ask them to do mental arithmetic in front of an audience, and people get really stressed out by that. Um, the people in the audience, you know, look, look very ominous. Um, and uh, you found that uh, the borderline patients after this um, stress test show much more distress, uh, more than the healthies. But then um, when you uh, then cut some of them, you have them experience the pain, it turns out that the borderline patients show a drop in their level of stress after they've had this pain experience compared to the non-pain experience. And if you look at what's going on in the brain, it turns out that in uh, borderline patients, the activity of the amygdala drops as a result of pain 
um, after they've been exposed to stress. And also the connectivity between the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the amygdala increases in borderline patients as a result of the exposure to stress. So, you know, it raises the question that some of, you know, that some of the self-cutting behaviors that we see in borderline patients may be, you know, in, in a certain way adaptive in helping patients kind of downregulate their, uh, their stress, although obviously it's maladaptive in other ways. Um, so uh, let me just summarize um, what we've learned. That there are structural differences in the brains of borderline patients. The middle prefrontal cortex is smaller. The anterior cingulate is smaller. Hippocampus is smaller. The story is still out on the amygdala. Um, there are anomalous uh, task-related activities, um, increased limbic excitability in the amygdala and the insula, and a sluggish recruitment of these control regions, these uh, top-down control regions, the dorsal ACC, less recruited during cognitive reappraisal, less recruited during habituation, the, dorsal, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, less recruited during cognitive reappraisal, and the insula showing this kind of blunted, this kind of obliviousness to these social phenomena going on in borderline patients. And um, also anomalies in the connectivity, in the network connectivity. Um, we found that uh, habituation in borderline patients didn't lead to increases in insula amygdala connectivity, whereas it did in healthy people. And uh, that interesting resting state data that we showed that there was less connectivity within those three networks and also between those three networks in uh, borderline patients. Um, let me just skip over this slide and um, talk about, uh, you know, are there any treatment implications from any of this work? Well, first, um, the, the mere fact that we've been able to show that there are differences in how the brain is activated in borderline patients is something that a lot of borderline patients find actually very reassuring because it reduces the level of stigma, and they really appreciate that. And um, so one element in treatment is certainly to share this information with the patients, to let them know that, you know, this isn't just all, uh, you know, kind of made-up stuff. Uh, this is something that actually uh, shows up in the way the brain is functioning. Um, the second is uh, that intriguing finding we have that practice with cognitive reappraisal actually gets people to kind of borderline patients to sort of normalize how their brain uh, is processing uh, regulation of emotion. So maybe one can develop more sophisticated um, and elaborate practice strategies to let people become more adept and uh, kind of um, muscle up their brains in this way by exercise. Um, the next is um, when we brought people back three days later, we found that the borderline patients had this big jump up in amygdala activity to uh, scenes that they'd seen before that they'd sort of gotten a little bit used to. And that raises the question that we may really want to consider the timing of revisiting distressing situations in the course of therapy. We therapists do that all the time to help patients work through the process, understand what was happening. But it may be that we really need to give some thought to the optimal timing for that, or maybe do some preparatory work so that when the material is revisited, the subject has some more skills to regulate their emotion. Um, and then, you know, the pain finding is kind of very interesting. Uh, I said use the pain system benignly to lower aversive tension. Well, actually, um, a number of borderline therapists are, have been doing this, um, using a technique with very um, uh, distressed borderline patients of suggesting that the patient plunge their hand into a pail of ice water. And uh, patients report that that can be calming and soothing. And it may, it's probably because of what we just saw is going on in the brain. Maybe we can think of sort of more creative and benign ways to take advantage of this in some way. Um, so um, what are some directions to go from here? Well, one is um, the specificity question. So many of these studies have compared borderline patients to healthies 
but not to other psychopathological groups, to other personality disorder groups. And so much more work should be done using psychopathological control groups. Um, gender effects haven't been really well studied. Um, many of the patients just look at female borderline patients. Um, and then other studies look at males and females, but the sample sizes usually aren't big enough to separate out the gender effects. So more should be done with that. And the next thing is, uh, and this really connects back to what Bruce, Bruce Cuthbert was talking about, looking at dimensional perspectives. So um, the, uh, you know, the field is um, looking at, the, uh, at conceptualizing personality disorders along a series of dimensions, and it may be that these dimensions cut across diagnoses. The dimensions may be more closely related to biological uh, underpinnings. And so to look, at, um, to look at these dimensions, and in the study that we're just starting now, we're looking at affective instability as a dimension which cuts across diagnoses, and to try to tease out other dimensions that we can look at. Um, and then to look at the neural correlates of specific treatments. So if people receive uh, psychotherapy, DBT, how does that affect their brain? And I'm saying this as a kind of preview to a presentation um, that Marianne Goodman's group and other groups are going to be talking about later in this meeting, uh, showing the, re the results on the brain activity of psychotherapy processes. So let me... Um, introduce you to uh, our photogenic uh, research team, some of whom are here with us today, and uh, give thanks to our collaborators and uh, the NIMH for, uh, for supporting us for our work, and uh, thank you. Thanks.